Thank you. You may be seated. Isn't it nice to know that we have a firm foundation to stand on? We have something that has been forever established in heaven. It doesn't matter what, what man says or how man uh, desires to change it or what man, man wants to, to do to God's will or God's plan. It is still God's plan and it is forever established. Why? Because it is the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Truth never changes. Consequently, the foundation that God has given to us and established for us hasn't changed, doesn't change, and will not change because truth doesn't change. That is a great truth, and it's a truth that we need to keep in perspective as we continue to serve Him in the day in which we live. Our title this morning, Walking as a Christian family, uh, continues the theme of walking. And as we walk together, and as, as we unite ourselves with God, as we're filled by His Holy Spirit, as we're walking with Him, it's important that we are understanding and we're continually plugged into His Word. Because the longer we're plugged into His Word, and the more time we spend in His Word, the more exciting it is to see how that God is working in our lives. It's exciting as I, as I hear some of you as, you re, as you're reading through the Bible in a year. It's a milestone, right? I'd like to challenge you with this. If you had the time, all right, like some of my students did at Rockview, SCI Rockview, some of those men re, were, would read through their Bible five times in a year. But they had all the time in the day, right? Uh huh. And that makes a difference. But it was so impressive because as they come, they're so filled with the scriptures. It's fun to see their insight. Why? Because here you take someone who we call criminal, right? Done criminal things, has, has been involved in criminal activity, and therefore we consider them unsafe for society. And we begin to see that person saturating themselves with the Word of God, and you begin to see the change that comes because of the time that they spend in the Word of God. Very, very important. If God can do that to someone with a criminal mindset, beloved, He can do that in your heart and my heart as well. Praise God. And so I want to challenge you. You don't have to read through the Bible in a year. But I want to say you have to spend time in God's Word I will go a little further. Daily, each day. It doesn't have to be forever and ever and ever in a day. It doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't have to be a set time. But it's good if it is, all right? It's good if it is a set time. Why? Because unless I make a set time, so many things in life come and get in the way, amen? amen. They do. They just, they just push things out that we want. Why? Because we're so wrapped up in the physical that sometimes we lose sight of the spiritual. So it's important that we take a physical time slot and say, this is my time in the Word. This is my time with the Lord. This is my time for prayer. This is whatever it is. And set that goal as not just an idea, but a goal that we live by. And, may I say, a lifestyle that we live. Very important. All right? Now, it's not just something that I do because I have to, but it becomes a lifestyle. I'm so wrapped in God that I don't want to forget to spend time in His Word. So we're looking this morning at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, and Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. We're looking at the Christian family. And I want to say right at the start here, the Christian family, as written here in Ephesians chapter 5, this isn't me saying it, it's not you saying it, this is God saying it, it talks about a wife and a husband and children. It doesn't talk about two husbands and children. It doesn't talk about two wives and children, two mommies or two daddies. It talks about a husband and a wife and, a ch and children. There are people in our society, there are people in our world that choose what we call an alternate lifestyle and, that, and, and society says that's okay. I'm not here to judge those people. I'm not here to judge that conduct. I'm here to say that the Bible, as it talks about a Christian family, talks about a different standard. That's God's fault. That's God that said that, not me. 
And this is the Word of God that we're looking at. And so this morning as we look at this subject, first off, we want to look at it according to what God's Word says. Second off, I want you to understand that I'm not trying to tell anybody the right way to do it because of my experience, because I have very little experience in, in the whole subject. And so I'm not here as an answer person. I'm here simply addressing a very important, a very vital subject in the Christian walk and in the Christian life. And that is the Christian family. And walking together, which means being united and going in the same direction. Some time ago, I, uh, I found it very interesting because um, I had a friend, friend, the two of us were, were working on a project. I was actually working on a tree stand that I was going to use in, in, the, in the mountains while I, was, while I was archery hunting. And I had this big, long uh, safety strap. And it ended up that we were both trying to figure this thing out. And uh, he was on one end and I was on the other end. And we both started pulling the opposite directions. And it was kind of hilarious to watch it all happen because neither of us ended up very well. We were both tripping each other. We just couldn't do it until we both started pulling in the same direction. All right, That's as a Christian family. As we walk together, we need to walk in the same direction. And as we are led by God's Spirit, let's remember, God's Spirit doesn't lead us two different directions. God's Spirit, as we walk with Him, and as we follow Him, and as we submit to Him, He will lead us in the same direction. Number one, as we start here with the wife, I started in verse 22. But let's remember, in order to get number uh, verse 22 at the proper perspective, we need to go back to verse 21, and it says, number one, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submission is not something only designed for the wife. It's designed for all of us to submit ourselves under the almighty hand of God. And as we submit to Him, as we submit to His leading, as we submit to who He is, as we submit to His identity, then we as His people are learning the fear of God. We're learning the obedience to God. We're learning that we don't need to fear God from the perspective of judgment, but we fear God and we fear the idea of disobeying Him. And in so doing, we desire to obey Him and desire to follow Him. So we see submission starting here as we submit one to another. Number two, with the husbands, we see the idea of loving your wife. But that's not just something for the husbands. You go back to verse 2. We are to walk in love as Christ has loved us and given Himself for us as an offering and as a sacrifice and as a sweet-smelling savor before God. So we see that love is that sweet-smelling savor before God and it's something that God gives to all. He shares with all. He sent His Son in the fullness of time to bring His love to mankind so that mankind would understand it and perceive it and grasp His love. And in so doing, we partake of that love and we disperse, disperse that love among ourselves and to those around us. Why? Because He first loved us. We don't produce love. God produces the love and He gives it to us and He shares it with us. So consequently, husbands, loving your wife is a natural thing, but also it's a command of God that we all love one another and that we follow Him and we walk as... You go back to verse 1 in this chapter. Walk as dear children and as you're walking as God's dear children, then He says, next step, Walk in love. Walk in love one with another and walk in love with Him. Then we go on to the children and we see that children are to obey. Now, we need to realize several things. Children are to obey their parents. But we also realize that we are all to obey our Heavenly Father. And you say, well, what, which verse do you have that in? And I say, well, you have it in this verse right here. <laughs> all right, it's that we all, as God's children, uh, you look through the Scriptures and uh, you see that uh, 
idea of obedience. In hours, you're talking about the, the minor prophets and the idea of sin and how the minor prophets are calling us to the idea of redemption. You see the third chapter of Genesis where sin is, is brought into the human experience and then all of a sudden we begin to realize the necessity for a redeemer. It is imperative that man is redeemed, amen? Because he has fallen, now he needs a redeemer. And if man has fallen, then man somehow needs to redeem himself. But because man is sinful, man no longer can stand there and be that redeemer for himself. Why? Because he's defiled, he's dirty. He needs that cleansing from God. Therefore, he needs a redeemer to be sent. And so we see throughout the Old Testament, God is promising. It starts there in Genesis and says there is a need for a Redeemer. And then throughout the Old Testament Scriptures, over and over and over again, you see there will be a Redeemer. He will come. He will come in the fullness of time. He will come to redeem His people. And then we see Christ coming onto the, onto the, into the picture. And they say, oh, are you going to set up your earthly uh, kingdom now? And Jesus says, you're missing the point. I'm not here to set up an earthly kingdom. I'm here to redeem you. You're my people. I've come to purchase you to myself. I've come to pay that demand note. All right, that ransom. I've come to pay that ransom. Why? Because I want to redeem you to myself. I am that redeemer. And so as those Old Testament prophets, they promised that redeemer that he would come. Why? Because God says, this is my love to you and I'm coming to show this to you so that you will willingly submit to me. Two, that you will willingly obey me. And third, you will willingly love me. And that's our, that, there are points here this morning. Why? Because you need to be redeemed and you can't redeem yourself. You need to. So, in the book of Hebrews, it says, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, made like you and I. Why? Because that's who He came to redeem. He didn't come to redeem the animal kingdom. He didn't come to redeem the angelic beings that, that disobeyed and fell from God. He came to redeem the human race that needed the redemption that the promise of redemption had been given to. And the promise of redemption was that I will come and I will redeem you unto myself. Why? Because I made you and I will purchase you. You are my people. I want to be to you a God and I want you to be to me a people. I want you to follow me. And as I mentioned, I think it was last week, the idea that, you know, I purchase, you're my people, you're my chosen possession, in spite of the fact that you're disobedient and, and you're, you're falling away from me and you're stiff-necked and you're rebellious and you're not following me. In essence, God's saying, I've not chosen you because you're so good. I've chosen you in spite of the fact that you're not so good. I've chosen you in spite of the fact that you can't redeem yourself. I've chosen you because I want to redeem you and I want to show the world that I am here to redeem a people in spite of their sin, in, in spite of their background, in spite of the fact that I call them sinners, I've come to redeem them to myself. Why? Because I am God and I am good and I am redeeming you because of who I am, God is saying. I'm not redeeming you because of who you are. I'm redeeming you because of who I am. And so we look at our subject this morning and we realize that as Jesus came and he wants the church to follow him and submit to him. So he speaks to the family. And he says, I want you to be a living example of what I want my church family to look like. I want you to be a living example of what it is to be part of my family and to walk and live and maneuver under the auspices of being redeemed people. So we see, number one, the idea of submission. It's not submission because the wife is lesser than the husband. It's submission because it gives a, a demonstration of what the church is to its head, Jesus Christ. And as the church is submitted to Jesus, as this church is living in submission to Jesus Christ, so the wife lives in submission to the husband. When we look at the yesterday, we, we went to a, 
to a wedding. And as I stood there, and as I watched the bride and groom exchange their vows and become joined together in matrimony, in holy matrimony, I stood there and I, and I didn't see a, a blood transfusion. I didn't see, I didn't see a, an, an operation take place. But as she left that place, she became Mrs. Brown. Why? Because she was joined together with her husband and it becomes a not just a physical union, but it becomes a divinely uh, viewed, viewed as a divinely ordained union before God. And all of a sudden, her name is changed. Why? Because she is joined together in matrimony in the fear of God. And it was nice because you see this, and it was a Christian union, it was a Christian family, and two people were brought together in the fear of God. All things perfect and right and upright? Yes. Why? Because they were forgiven by God, right? They lived before God as, as His children. They walked before Him. And all of a sudden, you begin to see this example of what happens in a Christian family. We also see not just submission, but we see the idea of the Holy Spirit being manifest in the beauty of the union. Not only as the wife submits to her husband, but we need to realize that the husband, first of all, needs to be submitted to his head, which is God and Christ and the church. And we have this whole perspective that the husband himself needs to be in some... So now we have the next question. What happens if the husband is an unbeliever, right? That's the next question. And we see this happening from time to time. And we see in, in the book of Corinthians, it says, you know what? Don't, don't separate at, at, that ex at that time in your life, but be that living example of the love of Jesus Christ and be that living example of what it is to be redeemed. Be that living example of what it is to be filled with the Spirit of God so that the Holy Spirit is leading you and guiding you and directing you. And so we see the importance of the submission to the Spirit of God and following His Spirit so that ultimately the family becomes a signpost. Hey, we belong to Jesus Christ. This is who our God is. This is who we're submitted to. This is who we are because this is who we worship and we are submitted to Him in spite of it all. Some time ago I was... I was uh, made aware of, of a family who seemingly went through all kinds of issues and troubles. And every time something happened, they turned right back to their Heavenly Father and they gave Him credit. And they've gone through all kinds of trials and troubles and tribulations. But you know what? Every time it happens, they continue to turn the focus back to their Heavenly Father. And you know what? They have a lot of respect from a lot of people. Why? Because they're showing forth Jesus Christ in submission and obedience to Him. Beloved, you know what? If we only serve Him when everything is good, it's a very shallow life. Amen? But when we submit ourselves to Him, uh, submit ourselves under the almighty hand of God, even in trough tough times, even in trials, and as we are led by His Spirit through the hard times of life, that is when the world looks on and sees the change that comes because we are submitted to Him in fear, reverence, and obedience to Him. Number two, husbands, we need to realize that the love of God brings us to the place where we love our wives and that we realize that God has sanctified and cleansed and forgiven the church. So now, now all of a sudden, the husband is beginning to look at who? Jesus Christ, right? So the eyes of the husband are fixed on his Savior, Jesus Christ, and he begins to emulate the example of what Christ did for the church, right? He comes and He gives and He lives and He shares. He gives His life. He gives His energy. He gives all that He has. Why? So that He can sanctify the church and purify the church and call the church to Himself. And ultimately, the church is changed. The church comes to the place where they carry the name of 
Jesus Christ, right? It's a Christian church. It carries the name of their head, Christ, as the wife carries the name many times of her husband. Not always, but they, beca they become identified one with the other, even if that name change isn't there, right? The idea is that Christ came to sanctify the church. And so the husband comes in the family union to sanctify and to encourage and to upbuild and to be that sanctification for his family. Not that they never make any mistakes, but that they are brought to the place where they are driven, where, where they are, where they are brought to the understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Why? Because of the example he has given to the church. And as the husband comes to love his wife, we realize that it's not a self-seeking only relationship. It's not a selfish relationship, but it is a self-sacrificing relationship just as Jesus Christ came and get, was that self-sacrificing individual for the church, calling the church to Himself, redeeming it to Himself, calling them and sending them forth. So the husband is to realize that it's not a selfish, self-centered relationship. But it is a relationship that draws one another to the idea of sanctification and cleansing. That we might be sanctified to our Heavenly Father. That we might be cleansed. That we might be drawn to Him. That we might realize that it is not just... What does it say of the, of the priest? It's not just the washing of the hands. It's not just the changing of the garments, which was very, very important in the worship service, right? Right? And if something happened in the, the priest, for, for one reason or another, there were times throughout the worship service where he would change his garments. Why? So that he could be clean in the idea of worship. So that he would be cleansed. So that he would show the importance of being cleansed and sanctified to the people. That God is showing to His people through the, the idea of, of example. I want you to know in my sight it is imperative that you are experiencing that cleansing or that purging. That you are bringing yourself to the place where your heart is washed and you are presentable before me. Husbands, this is your job in the family. Why? So that we might bring glory to our Heavenly Father. So that we might bring glory and that we might be lifting up our Savior. He said, as, as, as I'm lifted up to the world, I will draw all men unto myself. So our job is to lift Christ up to the world around us. Our job is to show the world that we do have a Redeemer. That there is one who came, that gave Himself, that gave His life, that gave His blood, that gave the, the redemption, that paid that ransom for you and I. Why? So that we can glorify our Heavenly Father. So that as we walk before Him, we are bringing glory not to ourselves, but that we're bringing glory to God. And, let me say this, the next idea of the children. It's important that we understand. Some time ago, my, my friend had uh, made, made the decision to take his children out of a private school and send them to a public school. And he comes, he says, what, what do you think about that? And I said, well, you know, I spent 12 years in the public school system. I said, uh, it's not all bad. But I said, one thing you need to remember. He had four energetic little boys, right? And uh, I said to him, I said, there's one thing you need to remember, and that is as your boys go to school and rub, rub shoulders with everybody else, there's going to be conflict. And I said, that's going to be a perfect opportunity for you to explain the love of Jesus Christ to your neighbors and your friends and those around you. Why? Because all of a sudden, all of a sudden, your family is exposed in a whole new way. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And it brought things to a place where he could point out not the mistakes, not the failures, but he could point out the fact that a redeemed individual is not standing there uh, pointing fingers at everybody else, but he's standing there to bring glory to his heavenly Father and take those hard situations and bring glory to God through them. The idea that we are cleansed, 
that we are presenting our bodies as a holy living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service, right? And we're bringing that reasonable service to the place where we understand that Jesus gave His all for me. And I need to give my all for Him. Consequently, I am bringing the glory, not to myself, but to the One who redeemed me. Thirdly, the idea of obedience is a stronger word than submission. Children, obey your parents. Children, obey them. Honor your parents, your father and mother. It is the first commandment with promise. Let's remember that it's one of the Ten Commandments, and it is the first of the Ten Commandments that brings a promise. Honor your father and mother, that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. And then it goes right on to say, as the children grow and honor their parents and live in submission to them, And realize, remember, we went over this on Mother's Day when we talked about Jesus submitting himself to his parents. What's it say? He was 12 years old. He's now considered a young man. And it says, uh, Mary, Mary finds him in the temple and says, don't you realize we saw you sorrowing for the last three days? And Jesus says, don't you realize? I was sent to do my father's business. Don't you get this, Mom? And then the next verse says, He went home and was subject to them. Showing the beautiful example of what God the Heavenly Father desires for the children of our day. Tell that to a bunch of youngsters, right? (laughs) Tell that to society today, right? No, it's important that we understand this is God's will for for the Christian family. Maybe not the worldly family. Maybe not the carnal family. But for the fam, Why? Because you're led by the Spirit of God. This goes right back to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And as the Spirit is leading us and guiding us and directing us. Yeah, I say this carefully. I say this with my hand over my mouth. Right? Because my little geikers are running around here and you're all saying, oh my goodness, look at all that energy, right? And I'm worried about this, right? No, I can't make their decisions for them. But it's our hope and our prayer that as they grow up, they will learn to make wise decisions for themselves and that they will grow up seeing an example of wise decisions and being able to say, oh, I get it. So that's how it works, right? In a good way, right? And learning submission to their Heavenly Father as mom and dad submit to God, the church, the family around us, and as we see the whole idea of obedience to one another, as obedience to God, our Heavenly Father, and as children learn that submission, you and I as children need to learn that obedience to our Heavenly Father. No, God isn't just 100% like an earthly father, but we have to have some kind of comparison to understand what God is like, right? So Jesus, in in his earthly ministry, he comes to his disciples and says, now, if you really want to talk to God, don't talk to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob like you've always been taught, right? That was the Jewish mindset. This is what God did with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what God did with the Old Testament patriarchs. This is what God did. Jesus said it needs to be more than that. And as you come to him, you need to come to him and say, our Father which is in heaven. Why? Because we need some kind of comparison to compare him to. Father in heaven, Jesus says to him, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing, right? And as his children, we come to him in response. We come to him and say, God, we want to obey you. We want to serve you. We want to follow you because You are our Heavenly Father. We want to submit to you because we are your children. We're part of your family. Not because we deserved it. Not because we earned it. Not because we belong there. But because we've been redeemed by your outstretched hand. We become part of your family through adoption. And we come to you in obedience to you. And say, God, we desire to be part of your family. And that's exactly where we were in the beginning of Ephesians. We're no longer strangers. We're no longer foreigners. We're no longer held out. But now we're embraced 
by God's redemption and we're filled with his spirit. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning as we spend time in your word again, we thank you that you have a established pattern and you have a set standard for your people. We pray that we may be kind and gracious with the people around us, with those around us that might disagree with our point of view, Heavenly Father, but that we would be strong and firm in your word, realizing that it is your word that is forever established. It is your word that is forever truth. It is your word that is forever the same, established in heaven. And so we want to live with that. We want to stand on that. We want to stand on the truth that is never changing and forever the same. Give us strength as we journey with you and for you. May we bring glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 413, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Let's stand together as we sing this song. We think of life and the way that the Christian family orients itself around God. It is important to remember that He is the bread of life. And as we break the bread of life, it's important that we serve Him in all aspects of life. 413.